So in my talk today, I'm going to be talking for the first time about um, uh, how we've designed a Polygon Mining Rollup and specifically how we use this hybrid UTXO and account-based model to achieve some interesting properties. Um, so just to set the context at first, um, I, I, the goal that we have in mind is we want to build a scalable decentralized rollup with uh, privacy-enabling architecture. And what I mean by that is that our immediate goal is to achieve scaling, but we want to design the rollup in such a way that when we want to turn on privacy, it will not require uh, a complete architecture overhaul. It should be uh, very easy to achieve that. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you here are already familiar with this, but just to set a context of what is a decentralized rollup, we have users, we have rollup operators, um, and we have Ethereum L1, and uh, in this model, um, users send transactions to the operators, operators aggregate those transactions into blocks, and then they submit kind of the state delta in a context of a ZK rollup with a ZK proof to Ethereum L1. And then um, uh, what we get, and this is not specific to a decentralized rollup, this is uh, true for any rollup, um, we inherit security from Ethereum. Um, what is specific for a decentralized rollup is that a, a rollup is, has its own L2 uh, chain and its, um, its own consensus mechanism because the operators need to agree on the state of the, uh, of the chain. And then we want to have these operators to be, um, the set of operators to be permissionless, meaning anybody can join and leave the set as they please. Um, now, compared to a centralized rollup where we have only one operator, um, a decentralized rollup has a number of challenges. And the most important ones are, um, you know, you, you need to have a separate consensus mechanism. Um, you, knew, you also have this execution bloat problem, and I'll explain what it is uh, in a couple of seconds. And then you have a state bloat problem. So in this, uh, talk, uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about specifically execution bloat and state bloat. And so let's get into it. So what is uh, execution bloat? An execution bloat basically means that the network needs to execute all the transactions. And more specifically, a block producer needs to execute on the transactions in the block, but also everybody else in the network needs to re-execute the transactions to make sure that the block is valid. And you know, that leads to a lot of re-executing the same code over and over again. Um, what is state bloat? Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that. This is basically means that state uh, size grows with time. The more accounts there are, the more tokens accounts hold and all of that, um, you know, the state size increases. And the reason why we can't do much with, about that is that uh, nodes or operators need to be able, need to hold the full state to be able to validate uh, the blocks. And uh, nodes need the full state to be able to produce new blocks. Now, why are these things bad? Like I said, there are challenges, so why exactly are they challenges? So the first thing is, um, if you have state bloat and execution bloat, you need powerful machines to, like, you know, let's say we have thousands of transactions per second, you need a powerful, powerful machine to process that. If you have a large, you know, terabyte size state, you need a large machine to um, hold that in memory, and that leads to a centralization. And if you don't have good solutions to this problem, you might as well just build a centralized rollup. Uh, the other one, because everyone sees everything and everybody needs to re-execute transactions and have the full state, um, there is inherently less privacy uh, in, this, uh, in this setup. And uh, last one is especially um, specific to state bloat. This is not sustainable. If the state grows, you can you know, scale the rollup only as fast as the hardware scales. You can, you can go uh, like a hardware in a single machine or something like that. Um, so what do we want to achieve? What is the ideal solution to this? So the first thing, we want to minimize execution bloat. And that means uh, we want to execute transaction only once. And also, we want to make sure that it doesn't have to be executed by the same party. So it's not the same block producer that needs to execute all transactions. We want to have distinct actors in the network that can execute transactions. Um, we also want to minimize the state bloat, and that means um, we don't want to enforce the condition where you need to know the full state to validate blocks. And we also don't want to enforce the con condition where you need to know the full state to produce new blocks. Um, ZKPs can give us you know, these two upper properties. Um, if you have ZKPs, um, you can you know, produce a proof of execution, for example, and you don't need to re-execute the same transaction over and over again. But to achieve the other two properties, you need something else. ZKPs alone are not enough. You need what I call a concurrent uh, state model. Uh, and before I get into the concurrent state model, let's talk about like, the popular approaches to what are, you know, the, you know, the popular state models right now. So we usually have an account-based state and a UTXO-based state. And if we look at pros and cons of each, uh, let's say for account-based state, um, you know, it's great for expressive smart contracts. This is what we love about Ethereum. We can write very uh, cool applications. You have a lot of freedom, and they all interact with each other very well. 
uh, it's not great for concurrent execution. It is possible to achieve, but it is not very easy uh, and you know, has a lot of uh, issues. And it is also bad for anonymity because if you want to, if you have accounts and you know which account participates in which transaction, uh, it's very difficult to hide kind of this transaction graph, so to say. UTXO-based model is kind of opposite of that. It's great for concurrent execution because uh, in a UTXO model, transactions are logically separate from each other. Um, it's actually a very good tool for anonymity. Like if you want to achieve anonymity, you uh, almost have to use a UTXO model. It's not the only thing that you have to use, but uh, it is one of the kind of basic building blocks. Uh, but it is not great for expressive smart contracts. Um, you can kind of get smart contracts in the UTXO model, but it's not easy. And you know, the more expressive they are, the more it starts to look like an account-based model. So what we want to do is combine um, pro the nice properties of each of this into a single model. And I call this like basically account-based model, UTXO-based model, and uh, combine that with ZK proofs. And we'll uh, get something that I call as the actor-based model with concurrent off-chain state. And I'll get into what all of those terms mean in the you know, course of this presentation. So first um, thing that I want to explain of how this works is how do transactions work in this model? Uh, and what is an actor model specifically and how we think of transactions in that model? So just to take a step back and explain what is an actor model, it's a concept from distributed uh, kind of systems where you have actors which are kind of state machines with inboxes. And uh, actors communicate by sending messages to each other. And uh, the important property is that the message is asynchronous. So an actor can produce a message, and then an, a different actor can consume this message at a later point in time. The way we apply this actor model to a blockchain is that in our context, in context of Maiden, uh, actors are accounts. An account holds a state and exposes an inter interface. An interface is just a collection of methods, which uh, you know, every of those methods is a Maiden VM pro uh, program. And Maiden VM is a you know, fully Turing complete ZK VM. Um, so uh, you can think about it as very you know, expressive functions that you can write uh, for the account interface. Accounts communicate with each other by sending nodes to each other, and nodes can carry assets. And the node also has this spend script, which needs to be executed to be able to consume a node. And one uh, important property is that in this model, it actually takes two transactions to uh, move assets from one account to another. So in a traditional kind of Ethereum model, for example, you usually have just one transaction that moves uh, assets from one account to another. In this model, you have to have two uh, transactions because the first transactions create a node, and the second transactions consume a node. Now, let's talk about transactions a bit, in a bit more detail. So what is a transaction in the context of Maiden? A transaction always involves only one account. The transaction does not involve more account. And you know, as a, in the course of a transaction, the state of the account gets updated. Um, a, a transaction can consume zero more nodes. And a transaction can produce zero more nodes. So in a previous example, for example, there was a, one transaction that produced one node and one transaction that consumed one node. And we can have also transactions that produce and consume nodes in the same transactions. Um, now, the execution graph of how, like, let's say, nodes get consumed, um, kind of to explain how this whole process works is, let's say we have a transaction that wants to consume two nodes in a context of one account. So the way it will start is, like, we have this prologue and epilogue that do some bookkeeping to make sure that, like, let's say, sum of inputs is equal to sum of outputs, uh, and nothing kind of no new assets get created in the, in the process of a transaction. But then we go into this execution stage where the first thing that happens is we call execute, we execute the script of the node. Um, of the first node in this transaction. And then this uh, uh, execute script can call any number of methods on the account interface. So you know, in this case, let's say there is a receive method that receives assets on the account. So a node can pass assets to the account through this receive method. And one important thing is that account uh, methods are the only ones that have access to account state. A node cannot modify the state of the account directly. It needs to call a method on the account interface to uh, modify an account. And then um, the account uh, interface methods can create other nodes. That's how you can, for example, cre uh, create new nodes in the process of a transaction. And then, um, you know, if we have another node, we do the same thing. We sequentially uh, execute the second node in the context of the same account, and that node can again call the same or different method on the, on the account to have different effects and so forth. Uh, now, in our context, the uh, because we can uh, kind of execute and uh, nodes only attach a single account, what we do is we execute a transaction and immediately produce a proof for it. So in our case, we use the Stark proving system. So Maiden VM is a Stark-based VM. So whenever a transaction is executed, we immediately produce a proof of execution. And because, again, I mentioned that transactions are logically distinct, they only touch each account separately, we can produce many transaction proofs in parallel. So uh, we actually produce all the, all the transaction proofs in parallel. And then what we do is, once we have a bunch of these transaction proofs, uh, we recursively aggregate them into, the, into batches. Uh, and these batches then recursively get aggregated into uh, block proofs. 
And then these block proofs get further aggregated into uh, like epoch proofs, and that's what gets submitted to Ethereum. Um, now, it's important to know that all of this recursive aggregation can also be done in parallel. So, as I mentioned, all transactions have been, can be uh, proved in parallel, but also all batches can be proved in parallel. The only thing that doesn't get proved in parallel is the final kind of tip of this uh, block proof. And then there is another interesting property is that um, we can prove transactions locally, and I'll get into that uh, in a second of what exactly it means, um, but then uh, these aggregation steps need to be done by the network. For example, a block producer or a block producer can delegate this uh, um, kind of aggregation to someone else, some other actors. Now, let's talk a little bit more about with this concept of local versus network execution. So in a traditional kind of uh, model, okay, when we execute a transaction, we have you know, a step that prepares some inputs for the transaction, signs the transaction, and so forth. Then we execute it. Um, then, in the context of a ZK system, we generate a proof for this transaction, and finally, we get this transaction proof uh, that, you know, according to the previous slide, gets aggregated into batches and finally ends up in the block. Now, in a network model, the block producer, so the user prepares the transaction, sends it to the, um, you know, the network, and then the block producer would execute this transaction, generate the proof, and then, uh, you know, aggregate this proof as I described on the previous slide. In a local context, the user can actually do all of this. So the user can both prepare the transaction, execute it, and generate a transaction proof. And then um, what gets sent to the network is actually just the transaction proof itself. And then the, uh, the block producer doesn't actually need to execute the transaction and doesn't need to um, uh, generate a proof for it. it, it just, uh, the block producer just needs to aggregate it with other transactions for which it has generated the proofs. Um, one important thing to notice, uh, how do we handle shared state? Because, you know, it works, what I described works very uh, nice when you have, like, transactions which go uh, and don't touch multiple accounts, or, like, when you have nodes that go to different accounts and so forth. But let's say we have something like a Uniswap situation where we want, uh, we have several accounts that want to send nodes and exchange, uh, let's say, assets for some other assets uh, uh, using a Uniswap account. So in, the way we would do it is that, uh, first, we would have, you know, each account generates its own transaction to create a node that it targets a Uniswap account. Um, this would be two separate, uh, log like kind of logically separate transactions. Uh, then the block producer would generate a third transaction that would consume the first two nodes in a single transaction, and also as a result of this consumption of this node, it would generate other two nodes that would kind of target back, carry like the exchange tokens back to the original accounts. And then we would, um, and then uh, we would have the, you know, additional transactions that uh, uh, the accounts, the users of accounts one and two would execute to consume kind of these nodes back into, the, uh, back into the, their respective accounts. So basically in this model, um, we still have this ability to interact with a contract uh, or account with a shared state. Uh, it just in this case, the uh, transaction uh, that interacts with the account with a shared state needs to be a network transaction. It's not a locally executed transaction, it must be executed by the network or the block producer, because the block producer needs to sequence the nodes uh, according to whatever logic they want to do, and then execute all of the nodes against the same uh, account. Now, just to kind of summarize this, uh, you know, pros and cons of local versus network execution. So if we want to have a shared state, kind of an account with shared state, we cannot use local transactions, but we can use network transactions. Now, if we use a local transaction, we can have privacy uh, because nobody actually on the network needs to execute those transactions. Um, we cannot have privacy with network transactions because obviously somebody needs to execute them. Now, generating proofs is a fairly computationally intensive process, so the client hardware requirements might be high for local transactions. Um, but on the flip side, because you've generated the proof locally, there is much less work than a block producer needs to do. Uh, they don't need to generate the proof for the transaction. They don't need to execute the transaction. So the fees for the such transactions, for local trans transactions, would be lower than for the ones that are uh, requested for the network to execute. Um, now, the next thing I want to talk about is what kind of a state model do we need to support uh, this type of transaction model? And this is where the UATXO and account-based model kind of comes together. So, um, my little rural update is actually described by three databases. Usually, you have a single database. You have usually an account database, or you know, in ETXO context, you have a kind of an ETXO database. But in our context, it's actually three separate databases. There is an account database, there is a nodes database, and there is a nullifier database. And I'll explain why, um, you know, why all of them are needed. And then in our case, updates to all of the three, three databases. So like when you have a block, a block contains information that updates all of the three databases and you know, takes the state of the uh, network from, you know, state n to state n plus one. Um, account database. Account database holds all of the, um, you know, current states of the accounts. Um, and we use a sparse Merkle tree um, to uh, kind of, uh, is a data structure that holds this information. Uh, and uh, the sparse Merkle tree maps account IDs to account hashes. Uh, 
but we have one kind of twist to this. We have two different types or two different modes of storing accounts in this uh, database. The first one is on-chain state, which is basically the same as what you would get with Ethereum, where for each hash, the nodes store uh, also all the associated data for the account, such as like storage, code, um, you know, nonce, and so forth. But there is also an option to do just an off-chain state where um, what the nodes store are just the hash of the account. And uh, the, the user himself or herself is responsible for storing the actual state of the account. Uh, so network, uh, nodes and network, not network don't, do not store the actual account state. Let's go to the nodes database next. The nodes database stores all nodes that have been ever created. And for this, we use a Merkle Mountain range, which is an append-only accumulator. Uh, and a leaf in this uh, Merkle Mountain range is basically just a set of nodes that were created in a specific block. And one of the reasons we chose this, uh, uh, there, are, there are a number of reasons why we chose the Merkle Mountain range, and it's very convenient for uh, a number of purposes. But one of this is that um, you can extend or add new nodes to this accumulator without actually knowing most of the previous nodes. So you can discard a big part of the, uh, of the nodes database and still be able to add new nodes to it without problem. The other pr property that is very important is ZK context because we need to prove the inclusion of um, um, you need, we need to prove that we're spending a node that has been, uh, you know, has been created at some point in the past, is that the witness, uh, kind of inclusion witness, does not become stale. So, you know, if you have a Merkle path, it actually just needs to be extended from time to time very infrequently, but it doesn't become stale. And that means that the ZK proof that you generate does not become obsolete very quickly. This is a, a very important in the ZK context. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we have the Nullify database. And the reason why we need this Nullify database is that, um, you know, we have the account database, which stores states of accounts. We have the nodes database that stores all the, all the nodes ever created, but we do not remove nodes from the uh, uh, nodes database because we want to have this nice property of append-only accumulator. Therefore, we need another data structure that will tell us which nodes have been consumed. So the Nullify database is something that keeps track of nodes that have been consumed. And for this, we also use a sparse Merkle tree where we basically uh, map a node hash to either 0 or 1. Uh, 0 indicates that the node hasn't been consumed. 1 indicates that the node has been consumed. So whenever we generate a proof for a block, the, the proof must include that you know, this node existed in the accounts database and it did not exist in the nullifier database. Um, we actually have a slightly more sophisticated data structure where there are multiple epochs and you know, those are time periods and for each epoch you have a separate nullifier tree uh, and then um, you know, nodes are expected to keep the last two epochs but can discard the nullifiers for the uh, prior epochs. Now, uh, we, have two, uh, we have this different databases and there are very different growth drivers for each of these databases. So an accounts database um, grows primarily with the, state of, with the number of public accounts um, or the accounts that have on-chain state. Uh, because if you, you know, it does grow with a total number of accounts, but if you only have to store a single hash for an account, that, you know, that's almost negligible. Like you can store a billion accounts and it's gonna be only 64 gigabytes. Uh, and also we can dynamically kind of prune this. We can, uh, you know, for accounts, for example, that haven't been used in a while, we can just uh, re remove all the data and store the hash for that account. And nodes can choose to do that if they wish to. Uh, the nodes database, um, grows with the number of unconsumed nodes. So as soon as a node is consumed, it can be safely discarded, and you don't need to store it anymore. Uh, so unconsumed nodes is what drives the, um, the size of the database, but also you can have this pruning where you can, you can remove some of the nodes and just keep the hash. And then finally, we have the nullifier database. And this one is a different one because you can't easily prune nullifiers. To be able to create new blocks, you actually need to keep all the nullifiers. And the nullifier database depends on the throughput. So like the more transactions per second uh, you have, the more nullifiers you need to keep in a, for a given epoch. We can make epochs smaller, but you know, there are some downsides to that. So uh, overall, um, you know, if we look at kind of like what sizes of these databases could be, that nullifier database is going to be by far the ones that drives the size of the overall state. It's going to be larger than the no nodes or account databases combined. Now, um, I have a few slides to wrap up the talk to say, well, well what did we achieve? First. We have this concept of um, different models of execution, so the network ex execution and local execution, and we have this concept of on-chain data and off-chain data. And the combination of this gives us the, you know, different nice properties. So for example, if we have on-chain data and network execution, this is a typical you know, public transaction, something that happens on Ethereum right now. We can also have stateless transactions if we have off-chain data but network execution, where um, you know, the network doesn't store the state of the accounts, for example, but the user needs to provide the state of the account with every transaction so that the network can execute the transaction. 
And the next thing we can do, if, if the data is off-chain and local execution is happening, we can have private transactions where the network is not aware not only of what code was executed necessarily, but also is not aware of the data that is in the account. And we can also hide the transaction graph using UTXO. Um, it's a, I'm not going to get into that right now, but it, it's a bit slightly more complicated, but we can do that as well. And then finally, for completeness, there is this uh, you know, local execution and on-chain data. I personally don't know which use cases that would cover, but maybe people will come up with something. How did we address execution bloat with those models? So first, we achieved no re-execution, so all transactions are executed only once. Uh, second, we have concurrent processing, where uh, transactions can be processed in parallel uh, on independent machines, and you can almost scale this thing horizontally by adding more and more machines to generate proofs. And finally, we have this local execution where uh, transactions uh, can be executed by uh, the users that are involved in those transactions. And the nice property here is the more locally proven transactions you have, the less burden, uh, computation burden the network has to encounter. Because let's say 90% of transactions are something that was proven locally, there is very little work that the block producer needs to do. To, uh, to, they don't need to execute them, they don't need to prove them, they just aggregate them into blocks. And then uh, regarding state bloat, we have uh, kind of this dynamic pruning, pruning where we can collapse accounts and nodes into their hashes. Um, we can have very light verifying nodes. If you only want to verify state transitions and you don't want to create new blocks, you actually don't need to maintain the nullifier database at all. And in that case, uh, as I mentioned, the nullifier database is the biggest part of the state, so you can actually discard the biggest part of the state. And uh, we have this nice thing where because the nullifier database dominates the overall state size, uh, the overall state size really depends on TPS. So the higher the TPS, the higher the nullifier, uh, the, the bigger the state, but it doesn't vary with the number of accounts, for example, as much or number of nodes in the system. And uh, last thing that I want to leave you with is that this is what we're trying to achieve, where the more privacy there is in, net in the network, the more scalable it is, the more scalable it is, the more private it is. And this is our goal with the Maiden rollup. Thank you. So how would the network resolve when two accounts try to spend the same UTXO, like in ATX or something like that? So um, if two accounts are trying to spend the same UTXO, that's a conflict. You can't spend the same UTXO twice. Um, so uh, I think the problem, um, so it's not really a problem in that case. Like if you are trying to spend, like if you, if you have UTXO and I have UTXO and we submit transactions for whatever reason that uh, both of us can consume, the block producer will need to decide which uh, of those transactions goes through. Because um, you know you can't uh, you can't um, execute both of those transactions simultaneously because there will be you know one of them will produce a nullifier that the second transaction will not succeed because the nullifier for this UTXO has already been created. So like in the Uniswap example, you can send so like you can send a node that says I, I want to swap token A for token B right at this price, and uh, somebody else can do the same thing. And those are two different requests. But then the block producer will aggregate those requests, sequence them uh, in a single transaction, and execute them. And there will be no conflict on that because the the state of the Uniswap contract gets updated sequentially after each. Uh, uh, consume node. So you're not consuming the same UTXO, you're applying the different nodes to the same account. But yes, that cannot be done locally. That needs to be done by a block producer. Um, it's an optimization. Uh, the idea is that if you want to have an, um, if like, let's say um, your node was created in a prior epoch and the nullifier was created then, you, you will need to provide the path uh, that proves that it, it, was, it hasn't been consumed yourself. The, node, the nodes are not responsible for that. So the, the nodes are meant to be like a short-lived object. So they are not meant to stay in a state for a long time. And if for whatever reason you decided to keep the state there for uh, quite long, that's your responsibility to be able to provide this proof to uh, the network. It's not network's responsibility to keep it for more than, let's say, six months or so. Thank you.